Good morning, Highland. It's great to see you. Thank you for being a part of worship today. And God has been in our midst and is continuing uh, to hover amongst us as we worship him today in spirit and truth. So as we talked about in the video just a moment ago, and I'm delighted to be a part of helping to bring week number three of our message series, Behind the Music. And in this series, we've been looking at some of the songs that we sing, why they became worship songs, and why they, how did they declare the worship of God, worship, and some of the background behind um, their being penned or authored. Some amazing stories that have been told already and, and a great one to come today. But as we've looked at these songs together, and as we've looked over these last few weeks, we've had a recurring phrase, a recurring theme that I want you to hear again and again, and that's this. For every season, there is a song. For every season, there is a song. Now, that's true in, in all of our lives. If you were my age or, or a bit older, perhaps, if you heard some songs written by Bob Dylan, you might hearken back to the 1960s, which was a, a pretty difficult time in our nation's history. President Kennedy had been assassinated. Uh, the, uh, uh, the president, uh, I'm sorry, President Kennedy had been assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Great race rioting taking place in, in, in our cities. The Vietnam War was spinning out of control with no end in sight. And Dylan's songs particularly reflected that season. For every season, there is a song. If you hear Lee Greenwood sing, God Bless the USA, or Bruce Sting, Springsteen sing, I'm, uh, I was born in America, what, what's the exact title? <laughs> we might hearken back to the 1980s when a, a patriotic fervor, particularly for the first half of the 19, 1980s, took over. For every season, there's a song. And when they, when they sang those songs, even though they still stir us today, it brought us back to then. In my own life, there's some songs that make me mindful of a season in my life. So anytime that I hear the, the, some songs sung by Chicago, okay, or the, the group Bread, or maybe Barry Manilow. Okay, how many of you have heard of Barry Manilow? I'm encouraged, okay. <laughs> All right. I think back of a great life event that, uh, that took place in my own life. You see, there was a, a lonely school teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, who was desperate for love and forlorn. When all of a sudden, her Prince Charming from Pennsylvania, that would be me, swooped down into her life and, and, and helped her to find love and relieved her the doldrums of reading, writing, and arithmetic. Oh, you don't buy that. Okay, let me reframe the story. A geeky guy in Pennsylvania moved to Atlanta, fell in love with a school teacher, and she was gracious enough to, uh, to become his wife, and 43 years later, we're still at it. But for every season, there's a song. Think back of those days. And it's so true in the, in the songs that we sing and what, what, what stirs in our hearts. And we're made mindful that music moves us. Mu music reminds us, it rekindles something within us. And music connects us. And such is the great truth in, in the songs that we sing to God or about God. We're made mindful of his immeasurable love. We're made mindful of that which draws us together in him. And we're moved by his awesomeness. The song that we sang this morning, a beautiful song, as Aubrey mentioned, was, a, was an older song, but a great hymn of the church. It was actually written in 1917. It was written by a, a guy named Frederick Lehman. You see his picture there. Lehman had been a, a, a rich businessman had, and was very, very prominent and well-to-do when, as a result of some, uh, some uh, business decisions that went south, found himself declaring bankruptcy and lost everything. So there was a season in his life after that as he attempted to regroup that he and his daughter, who had been a business partner with him and was also living with him at that time, found themselves working hard labor at a, at a packing factory that packed oranges and, and lemons. And it was a tough time. Tough physically, tough financially. What a fall from where he'd once been. 
But as he came to work this one particular day, he was, had on his mind and heart a, a sermon that his pastor had, had preached a couple, of days later, a couple of days earlier rather, that, that talked about the immeasurable love of God. And he couldn't get that thought off his mind as he reflected how he's experiencing that in his own life and just he couldn't let go of it. So he tells the story that an, on a break in his packing factory, he sat down literally on a crate that held lemons, took a stub pencil, and on the back of a card wrote the words, the first two verses of the song that we just sang, the love of God is greater far than any tongue or pen can tell. But in that day, the song wasn't fully complete until um, it had at least a third verse. And he and his daughter both were kind of stumped as to, okay, God had revealed the first two, but what about the third? What about beyond that? When at one point they remembered a story that, that they had heard that took place 200 years before. It took place in an insane asylum where there had been a patient there that had been there for several years and a very rough season of life in, in his life, and he passed away, and, and those who were working went in to clean out his room and to repaint the walls. And there, etched in, a, in one of the walls, obviously written in one of his lucid moments, were the words of a, of a Jewish poem that had been written a thousand years before, the words we just sang. Could, every, could, could we the ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Or could the scroll contain the whole? Though stretched from sky to sky. The immeasurable love of God. There was the verse, but that finished out the great truth and capped the great truth of the song that we just sang. The Apostle Paul, in his great letter to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, excerpts from that, remind us and tell us this great truth. Follow along with me these words as I read. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? Listen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness? or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, Paul wrote, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. And as we look at these words and as we consider the story that was just told and the song that we just sang, I want you to take some powerful words of hope, some powerful truths with you as we consider what God has in store for us today. As we, as we think about the fact that, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Here's the first great truth. Hang on to this. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. If God be for us, we just read a moment ago, who can be against us? No one. Nothing. You know, we live in a society that um, just seems to specialize in tearing people down. We don't build each other up well. And it's hard to live and it's hard and sometimes to, to communicate and to interact with people. If you're walking on eggshells and you feel one thing, if you say one thing, you're going to be branded this or that or the other. And, and, and it's just a tough season to live. And, and we wonder if, how can our life really matter? To whom do I matter? Who am I influencing? Who listens to me? Who needs me? Who is for me? God says, I am for you. So many times in our life, we walk through life with just a difficult cloud over our head. You might be seated, sitting in this place this morning having recently felt or been betrayed. And your worth is, is on the ground. 
For someone that you'd let grow the closest to you is one who, who hurt you the worst and they just left you standing there in the dust. Who's for me now, God said. I am for you. I'm for you. Or you might feel that, that you just don't quite measure up. There's so many standards, so much shaming put against us these days. And I just can't quite cut it. God says, I am for you. I'm with you there. In my own life, I spent a great deal of my life just convinced, I guess, that I just really couldn't cut it. The evil one was great at whispering in my ears, Greg, failure describes you. You just don't measure up. And on and on it would go. But God, in those moments, sometimes shouting, sometimes in his still, small voice, reminded me again, Greg, You matter to me. I am for you. And likewise, is he for you? You matter to God. From the millisecond that you were conceived in your mother's womb, he breathed, God breathed his breath of life in you. You carry God's DNA. You are his child. You matter to him. God is for you. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 118, verse 6, it said, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. So because of that, what can man do to me? Perhaps that's what Laman was thinking when he wrote the words, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. You matter to God. God said, I am for you. Second truth on the heels of that one is that God is with you. God is with you. There's never a moment, never a second when you are alone. You may feel kind of abandoned. You may feel like like the path is dark and, and there's no end in sight. God said, even in those times, as I'm with you in the greatest of times, I am with you. A verse that won't show up on your screen is this, reminding us from the 23rd Psalm where God said, yeah, the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Walking through. You are never alone. God is with you. Again, the psalmist from Psalm 46, 1 says this, God is our refuge and our strength. A constant, ongoing, never-ending help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We live in some anxious times. COVID seems to be recurring as its ugly head again. Uh, protests in our street that have turned violence violent. We don't sometimes know who to believe or what to think. But even in those times of anxiety, even in those times of fear... God said, I'm with you. I got this. I've got you. God is with you. We just sang, God's love is sure. It shall endure. Measureless and strong. God is for you. God is with you. Take this one to the bank. God will never leave you. You may have been or felt abandoned by others, but God will never abandon you. He'll never walk away from you. He'll never throw up his hands in disgust. He'll never leave you and go off to someone that's greater or more spiritual or more important or have more money. (laughs) God will never leave you. Jesus, in his last words to the disciples, before he ascended into heaven, said this to his disciples, and equally true to you and to me, I am with you, say the word, always even to the end of the age, even when you might feel that God seems absent, he's not gone, even when you have grieved him greatly, he's not gone, his erring child, song said, was reconciled and pardoned for his sin. 
She was a young girl that grew up, that grew up in, a, in a cherry orchard, really north of Traverse City, Michigan. And while it might be kind of an idyllic place to live, she felt anything but that. Her parents, even though they were a bit conservative, I'll give you that, she felt that they were just old-fashioned. They just didn't get her. And they had some real struggles with her piercings. They had real struggles with her, uh, with her tattoos, with the length of her, of her skirts, with the music that she listened to. And it seemed like night after night there was just an argument. They just didn't get it, she would say. And this one particular night after an intense conflict, she looked at her father and, in the face and screamed out to him, I hate you. I hate you ran to her room and slammed the door. But that night, she decided to, to work out a plan that she'd been thinking in her mind for, for weeks before. I've got to get out of here. So after everyone had gone home, or gone to bed rather, she crept out of the house, walked away, and never looked back. She'd been to Detroit only once before when the youth, church youth group went to hear, see the, uh, the Tigers play. But the newspapers in Traverse City had, had gone to great lengths to describe the, the evil and, and the horrors of Detroit, the, the, the gangs, the drugs, the murder rate, all of the above. They would never think to look for her in Detroit, California perhaps, Florida maybe, but never Detroit. On her second day there, she met a man who drove the biggest car that she'd ever seen. He offered her a ride, he gave her some food, bought her some clothes, gave her a place to stay. This was the life. This is what I was meant for. This is what my parents were keeping me from, she exclaimed. Well, the good life lasted for for weeks. It lasted for months. It lasted for a year. The man who she now called boss, the boss, had taught her some things that men particularly liked, and because she was underage, a premium price would be paid for her. And while it wasn't the most fun, the drugs kept her calm. And she lived in a penthouse, and she was able to order room service anytime she wanted. It was great. After about a year, the first sallow signs of illness began to appear. And she was stunned, really, at how, how vicious the boss became, just like that. We can't take any chances these days, he said. And before she even had time to think of what was happening, he literally picked her up along with just backpack and no money in, in her pocket and tossed her out into the street, a girl alone on the streets of Detroit. She turned a few tricks for a few nights, but that money she raised gained there didn't even pay for the habit, let alone paid for it to live. Sleeping, if you can call it that, for an underage girl in Detroit by herself. Sleeping was on a grate in front of the department store so she could get some heat. Winter was starting to, to, to roll in. It was cold. She was abandoned. She was alone. One night as she lay there freezing, her mind drifted back to Traverse City, Michigan. Why did I ever leave there? My dog at home eats eats better than I do. At that moment, she decided, I want to go home. Three straight calls to voicemail. Two, hanging up without leaving a message. The third being, Dad, Mom, It's me. I was thinking about coming home. So tomorrow night I'm going to get on a bus here and I'm going to come to Traverse Traverse City. And if you're there, wonderful. If you're not, I understand. I'll just keep going on into Canada. The next night she got on the bus. Distance, travel distance between Detroit and Traverse City with stops is about seven hours. And as every hour rolled by, the more the panic began to set in. What if they aren't home? What if they never got the message? What if they don't want anything to do with me? And so it went. Finally, Traverse City. Bus driver over a crackly microphone said, 15 minutes, folks. That's all we have here is 15 minutes. 15 minutes to decide the fate of her life. Up from her seat, walked down the aisle of the bus, down the steps of the bus, through the hallway leading into the terminal at Traverse City, Michigan. Nothing in a thousand years could have prepared her for what she, what she found when she walked through that door. 
For there in, in the bus station in Traverse City was a group of 40 relatives, brothers, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandmother, a great-grandmother to boot. They were all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers, noise a big banner across the hall, wall rather, saying, Welcome home! Welcome home! And then she saw her father. Their last words there were, I hate you. Now she approached him with a re- re- rehearsed speech in mind, Dad, I'm so sorry. But he threw his arms around her. He said, hush, child. There's no time for this here. The banquet's waiting for you at home. You see, nothing can separate us from the passionate, undying love of a father. And nothing can separate you, can separate me, from the passionate, undying love of our Heavenly Father. We just need to get on the bus What do I mean by that? What do we do with these words? Great truths. Perhaps in in your own life, even as you're you're here this morning, you really have never met or had a, a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. God's saying to you this morning, get on the bus. I'm waiting for you. Or perhaps you've at one time walked and lived with him closely, but a spirit of rebellion took over and you, like the girl in the story, you fled from him never to come back. And yet you were prompted to come home. Get on the bus. Stay on the bus. The Father's waiting for you. Or perhaps you know of someone who is distant from the Father. Encourage them. Have some Jesus conversations. Encourage them to get on the bus. The Heavenly Father is waiting. Nothing can separate us from His love. And this day, at this moment, His arms are open for you, saying, come home. Now, people of God, go from this place as ones who have experienced and are resting in the immeasurable love of God. Share that love as Jesus reminds us, as I have loved you, so must you love one another. Be his beacons of light, his beacons of love, as we rest in him, the one who's brought us home.